Gary Quinn, Director of Academic Engagement with Glasgow Caledonia New York College. The Center for Social Impact and Innovation at GCNYC is excited to present Resilience and Reconstruction, a virtual speaker series exploring the impact of COVID-19 on the common good. We hope that you enjoy today's event, Luxury Fashion Equilibrium, Marketing Strategy and Sustainable Innovation with Professor Natasha Radcliffe Thomas. After the presentation, there will, there will be time for a Q&A. Please type your question into the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen, and I will read the questions. Thank you, Natasha. Okay, so hopefully I'm sharing my screen now. So thank you so much, Kerry, for the um, introduction. And it's really great to be with everyone this evening. So thank you for joining um, the webinar. It's about a year since I was last in um, New York at your beautiful campus. So it's I'm joining you from London today, where it's the early evening um, here, and it's been a, a really lovely, crisp fall day. So as Kerry said, I'm going to talk um, to you for about 30 to 40 minutes through some kind of top line um, insights and thoughts around luxury fashion marketing strategy and sustainable in innovation. And then we'll have some time at the end for some questions. So it'd be great to hear um, you know, people's opinions and thoughts as we go through. So just a little bit of an introduction to myself. So I'm a professor of marketing and sustainable business at uh, the British School of Fashion, which is part of Glasgow Caledonian University's London campus. Um, there's a picture of me looking terribly proud of myself there with a Case Centre Award um, that I uh, won this year for a co-authored case uh, looking at ethics and sustainability. I think sometimes when people think about um, marketing and fashion marketing, they only think about it as being sort of trying to sell and, and advertising, but actually understanding marketing is understanding human behaviours um, and market conditions and then trying to, um, you know, design really good positive outcomes for that. In my um, previous life, I've been lucky enough to live internationally. So I've lived in London, where I am now, um, Hong Kong, and also in New York State. And I like to bring a sort of global aspect to lots of the research and the teaching that I do. So I try to, um, you know, think around marketing, sustainable business from a, a global perspective. And hopefully I'll bring some of that into the talk today as well. In the center of the slide there, I'm at a conference um, in Beijing, again, looking terribly pleased with myself. Um, and I really like to engage with the fashion community, whether it's academic, industry-wide, um, and students just to share insights, experiences, um, and, and keep my finger on the pulse. So a little bit about the university. Um, as you may be aware, we're the University for the Common Good. You may not know that we have three campuses. So the oldest campus and where um, everything started in Glasgow in Scotland with a really long heritage um, of creative industries, of industry more generally, technology um, and heritage luxury brands in terms of fashion. I'm based at the London campus and you'll be aware that um, this series is hosted by our New York sister campus. Um, and one of the, the strands that, that links all of our activities together is this idea of common good and, you know, around sustainable development. Um, and that's a real pleasure to engage with sort of young professionals in their studies in these kinds of areas. So the British School of Fashion, um, we're a boutique campus and we're based in East London. If you know the area, we're in Spitalfields. And again, this area has a real history in terms of um, you know, British fashion and textiles because it's where the Spitalfield silk workers um, used to be, I then went through various iterations and more recent time, it was kind of a bit of a center of the rag trade. And now it's both, we're on the doorstep of the City of London, so we have all of that kind of um, finance systems around there, but we also have a lot of fashion technology there, as well as a really, you know, a great um, source of vintage shopping. So anyone who likes vintage fashion, do feel welcome to come and say hello when we're all allowed to travel again. So a little bit about my life um, in fashion. I really love fashion, and when, I suppose in, in previous times, fashion had this really sort of glamorous associations. And this is the sort of image of the, you know, the supermodels at their height in the 1990s that I kind of think about and associate with the, you know, the, the great side of fashion. 
fashion was such an important and exciting industry, it's really expanded massively globally over the subsequent kind of decades. And lots of other industries kind of wanted to have a bit of the of fashion and, and existing sort of brands, people like Louis Vuitton, for example, have massively, massively expanded their operations, their products. And as you can see from the world map, their, their world reach. Um, and so clearly at the one side, that's been a, a, some kind of mark of success, but actually there's been a lot of unfortunately negative impact and externalities of the expanding sort of fashion and luxury industries and you can see you know from the image on the slide here there's um, a graphic from fashion revolution organization and there's an image of a pile of sort of textile waste and unfortunately in the in the last few years fashion has had some much more negative associations. And so a lot of times now when people talk about fashion, even if they think about it more in fast fashion, but they're actually um, associating it with some more negative practices. So we end up, and this is something we talk about with the students, you know, we have a, a, a paradox really, where luxury and fashion are, um, you know, should be aspirational, should be enticing people in, you know, I said the earlier image of, of the supermodels, the sort of glamour, aspiration, something we want to join in with. But actually more recently, we're, you know, we're seeing this negative side. And the fashion image on the slide here is from one of the sustainable luxury inno innovator designers, Stella McCartney. And a few years ago, she, um, you know, she's somebody who's always worked with integrity in this area, but she, she ran a marketing campaign that actually, um, as you can see here, placed a sort of high fashion model in a beautiful garment, but literally in a, a landfill, in a rubbish tip, a trash dump um, in Scotland. And it really kind of was to jolt, I think, awareness around these issues. Um, the other image on the slide is of the Sustainable Development Goals. Now these, although not new, we are in 2020 um, entering the decade of action. These are goals um, to support and achieve sustainable development globally, uh, along which offer sort of some quite a few challenges for the fashion industry to really rethink itself. And so these kind of conversations have been going on. There's a quote on the slide here from the Business of Fashion, um, who put out a state of fashion report each year in collaboration with McKinsey. And even prior to the, the pandemic, um, a lot of questions have been asked about the global fashion industry, about its negative impacts in terms of pollution and energy um, usage. But even prior to the pandemic, as it says here, you know, critics are saying that really this hasn't been taken seriously enough from the business side. At the British School of Fashion, I've been lucky enough to spend um, you know, the last year researching and now launching a new module in sustainable luxury. And so this is the question you know, that I was thinking about as I planned the module and that I'm now exploring with our MBA luxury students, thinking, you know, what is the concept? What are the practicalities? How do we um, develop a more sustainable luxury industry? And obviously fashion and luxury don't happen, you know, in a vacuum. They exist within you know, wider markets and the wider business environment. And so it's important for us to think about, um, you know, the different drivers of change in this, um, you know, in these areas. And so I'm going to go through some of these um, in the next couple of slides. So you see from the image here, I'm sure this National Geographic cover um, is really striking. And over the last year or so, there's been a massive realization about the negative impacts associated with the fashion industry. The British Fashion Council have commissioned and published a report. Um, you can see a visual on the slide there, talking about the impacts in terms of water usage, in terms of carbon footprint, in terms of textile waste, um, et cetera. And also not just thinking about sort of the clothing itself, but all of the activities, you know, um, shipping, packaging, all of these things. And so I think the general public have got a lot more awareness of, of these sort of negative impacts. 
Often we think about this in terms of fast fashion, but actually luxury brands have not escaped um, criticism. So a couple of summers ago, the British luxury label Burberry, um, it was uncovered that they had been actually uh, destroying and burning their own clothes and products rather than them being kind of sold off at a discount. And this was really a shocking practice to be discovered by the public and also the scale of it. You can see on the slide there, um, you know, nearly 30 million pounds worth of product. Uh, and I think maybe more shocking to, to the general public was the fact that this is going on, you know, this practice had been going on throughout the industry. At the same time, um, you know, our desire for more engagement with luxury has really extremely negatively impacted, you know, the earth and environmental degradation. This slide here um, refers to the cashmere industry and Kashmir, um, a lot of it come, is sourced from Mongolia, where the over the sort of expanse of the market, so the demand for Kashmir increased sort of threefold, um, which negatively impacted the land and with sort of mismanagement really also kept and maintained that almost at, well, around a fifth of the population actually living in poverty. So although the luxury industry has been expanding and there's been sort of, you know, more and more spent on it, the size of it's grown, but it has actually, you know, the people at the beginning of the supply chain at the bottom of the kind of pyramid have not felt um, the benefits. And then just another example here um, from earlier this year that was a bit of a scandal for luxury fashion again when it was uncovered um, through the New York Times piece that lots of luxury labels were exploiting the Indian sort of artisans and embroiderers working on some of their couture pieces. So again you can see how you know the associations of glamour and luxury are really um, at risk when we uncover these kind of stories and the public has had an appetite for um, you know, asking more, you know, where are clothes made? How are they made? How are people, um, you know, being treated along the supply chain? So and another area that, um, you know, we've been guilty of is overuse of carbon and in terms of, um, you know, shipping and et cetera. And there was a, a, some research here that's looking at carbon inequality and showing that really, again, the sort of impact of the top percentage and the wealthiest people in the world has been disproportionate. And so when we're now trying to look to rebalance, um, we're maybe asking emerging economies to bear the brunt of our decades of, of sort of misuse. And a lot of these different things have sort of conflated into a lot more what we've seen of sort of direct fashion activism, actually challenging a, a system that's about 150 years old of sort of international fashion weeks and the way that the industry has developed and speeded up through the 20th century into the 21st. And so we're seeing organizations like Extinction Rebellion uh, focusing on fashion and asking, you know, really serious questions of the industry. Now, all of that was already happening before the pandemic struck. And when the pandemic, um, you know, happened earlier this year, uh, we still don't really know what the long term impact is going to be. But you can see that a, an industry that was growing and growing is suddenly looking at losses in revenues um, and losses in values, although we are seeing, you know, recovery and bounce back in different areas of the world. But undoubtedly, um, the pandemic has caused you know, the biggest disruption and behavior changes in you know, probably within our lifetimes. And you can see from the slide here, the sorts of um, things that happened. Eight out of 10 of us have changed our behaviors. A lot of people have been looking to social media. A lot of people have been trying sort of new brands and services. So I'm going to look a little bit at the direct impact of um, you know, what happened with some of the fashion and luxury brands through COVID. And I'm calling this section, the resilience bits. So you know, what happened as the pandemic struck? Now, in the early days, of course, industry shut down and the response from luxury brands was really, I mean, one of shock, but just one of support. So closing stores, protecting communities. And we saw, um, you know, through Instagram, you've got an example here from Ralph Lauren, just talking about 
you know, community reaching out family using this kind of terminology. As the, um, still within the sort of early days of the pandemic, a lot of the luxury brands switched their production to support the kind of public health effort. And at the same time started producing content for their kind of fans and followers that was sort of reassuring, comforting. Um, and you can see uh, on the image on the slide there, you know, sort of homely um, and sort of letting us into their homes as much as, 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 as possible. Then from a Europe, more European um, perspective, the Caring Luxury Group um, announced that, you know, apart from closing production, but they also talked about ma their, making their own financial and physical contributions. And this had an interesting impact in terms of social, again, social media content. So um, the Caring brand Gucci, which is one of the most you know, popular and successful luxury brands, embraced the World Health Organization messaging and actually offered their pla their Instagram platform, which is terribly um, popular, to help spread messages around public health. And again, you know, this idea of community. Closer to home for me, um, the British Fashion Council worked with some British fashion designers to develop uh, reusable face masks, um, you know, that would raise money as well to support our national health service. And so we saw sort of luxury brands pivoting into different activities and being quite community spirited. Um, and all of, you know, through this whole period as well, we saw that the pandemic really awakened a lot of people's sort of empathy and the desire for people to reach out and help in their local communities and also to become aware maybe of some of the um, global impact of the pandemic. And then in terms of actually luxury uh, consumers, um, you know, looking at how people's behaviors changed around that a lot of people were thinking well they didn't really maybe want to go back into stores even when they started to open so that's a bit of a challenge for the luxury brands but one of the maybe more positive um, things is that a lot more people were feeling about the importance of sustainability so they really and i think you know we saw that with production closing down with supply chains with the negative impacts on producers in other parts of the world a lot of people maybe started to, to put a few thoughts together in this area so we've seen really for the last decade a massive swing towards you know more conscious consumption so in the past, I'm not sure that luxury consumers or fashion consumers were really thinking about social and environmental impact of their purchases or the industry. But more and more, um, you know, over the last decade, this has become a more important issue for especially for younger people. And the pandemic only really accelerated those kinds of changes and also accelerated uh, people's idea that, that not just governments, but businesses should be sort of responsible for more efforts to protect the environment. And so not just the general public, but people working in creative industries, were, were obviously living under the same lockdown conditions, having the same sorts of reflections that, that we might have all been having and thinking about how to build back better. And th again, this is from the Gucci um, Instagram and they had a lot of behind the scenes uh, work and looking at the creative sharing their sort of ideas and their, their home lives and their thoughts and reflections on the pandemic. And we see Gucci's creative director, um, Alessandra Michelle here in the slide here. Um, and really, you know, the quote on the slide starting with, you know, we went too far. Really, I think a lot of people within the industry had a bit of a wake up call, not before time, we might say, about the scale and the impact and how our own you know, individual and collective um, actions you know, have got us into the position we were in. We're starting to think now, um, even though, you know, we're in, still in a lockdown in the UK, but, you know, industry watchers are looking forward and thinking, you know, what are the likely outcomes? And so, um, and this is likely to be different, the industry recovery in different parts of the world, as you can see from the slide there. And we've just had a singles day in China yesterday with, you know, record sales um, during that period. So we can see there has been quite a rapid rebound there, but it remains to be seen, um, you know, what's coming next, really. One thing that definitely has accelerated and is front and center is digital. And so a lot of people, um, you know, where they had access to digital through the pandemic, went online for content, for entertainment and for 
e-tailing. So it's really a lot more people have switched, they've accelerated that move into digital. So that's a kind of important area. One of the ways that um, fashion responded to this, so in March, Shanghai Fashion Week was due to be an in-person event. They extremely quickly pivoted to um, a digital sort of platform. And you can see from the um, figures on the slide there, they had a very successful reported sales conversion from their digital fashion week. It gave uh, designers and show producers a chance to experiment with some of the new um, you know, te technology and innovations in the digital space. We've had Shanghai Fashion Week again, it's gone back into a physical format, but I don't think that the digital things will all be um, forgotten. But still back in March, um, again, Gucci, used the, um, I suppose, the platform, the digital platform and possibilities to engage with, you know, remember people were on lockdown, a lot of people were spending hours at home, and they really led us in behind the scenes, live streamed um, their creative process, and in common with several other brands, actually used their own staff to model their collection, which again is sort of, um, you know, quite a nice way for luxury brands to bring us closer to them. They also, um, you know, as things were starting to, to move a little bit, thought about how can we bring people into stores in a digital way and used, you know, the digital means and in this instance, video calls with client advisors to kind of start to, um, you know, re restart the retail. There's been a lot of consumer behavior research, and this is um, a report from Canvas 8. I uh, highly recommend you go and have a, a, a nose around what they've been doing. I think it's important to realize that we're actually not yet in any kind of new normal. And so the, the, the next section of the slides, I want to start looking at some of the, um, you know, what's likely or what has been happening as we start to reconstruct. So as I said earlier, a lot of, you know, um, industry and outsiders have been putting a focus on sustainability and responsible business through the early days of the pandemic, um, especially with lots of industry closing down, people were thinking, uh, you know, rethinking their consumption choices, maybe rethinking their travel choices, making all sorts of pledges, but we're not sure how much that's going to stick. And then the realities of business mean, you know, industry watchers have been thinking, well, are we just going to go back to the old ways? sustainable sort of initiatives. So I'm going to talk through some of the um, more positive stories here. So caring, um, uh, are one of the sort of leaders in the luxury field in terms of their work in sustainability. And interestingly, as you can see in the quote on the slide here, um, they were talking about it actually being a sort of a great time for sustainability in fashion, because there's a lot of, you know, I suppose with all the challenges, there's also been opportunities for innovations and um, I suppose in times of uncertainty sometimes going for going for something new it becomes a viable option. We had Stella McCartney on an earlier um, slide and I just wanted to talk about some of the sort of people innovators. So Stella McCartney um, as I'm sure you're aware is a designer who has always lived and her values She's been a lifelong vegetarian. She's brought her own personal sort of ideas about respecting nature um, and respecting the earth into a very successful luxury brand. While she was, you know, still working with caring, um, you know, developing a lot of material innovations, but also innovations in terms of product and in terms of marketing, as we saw from the slide before. One of the sort of um, positive and more hopeful areas as well is the embracing of the principles of the circular economy by the fashion industry. I've been lucky to do some work with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and they just um, released some reports about you know, circular fashion. And you know, the principles of circular fashion really are about keeping, um, you know, design, using design in a clever way. So you're actually designing out bad practices, you're designing out waste and pollution, but you're also um, you know, keeping products in use longer and also trying to work in a more regenerative system. So it's quite a radical um, philosophy, but a lot of the fashion and luxury brands are really kind of embracing this. At the same, we saw the, the plastic bag on the front of the National Geographic earlier. There's a lot of sort of innovations around materials and with the rise of things like veganism, people have 
leather, but unfortunately some of the leather kind of substitutes are actually plastic. And But now we're seeing some really interesting developments from sort of plant-based materials that can kind of, um, you know, replace that sort of plastic in PVC or, or PU. And another innovation in this area comes from um, Dr. Carmen Hijosa has worked to develop a really interesting kind of leather substitute from pineapple, from the fibre of pineapple leaves. So there's been a lot of interest in these sort of new materials. I um, recommend you go and have a little look around those later. We're also seeing sort of different business models. So this is a social enterprise based in the UK called Elvis and Cressy, and they um, work with, they reuse what would otherwise be waste materials starting primarily with um, fire hose so the you know the hose from fire trucks once it's got a tiny fault obviously can't be used um, by firefighters and so they developed processes to sort of rescue this material and to turn it into um, you know fabulous luxury accessories and then also because of the way the business is set up to make charitable donations and we're seeing a lot of um, especially younger and startup businesses really reimagining how what the whole luxury business model should be. I mentioned China a little bit earlier and we we with you know projected 50% of um, you know luxury spending being within China and a lot of production based there the fashion footprint of China is so important so I was very Singles Day aside, I was very pleased when I was last in Shanghai to attend um, an, an award ceremony organized by Caring, where they were launching the KGen um, Awards, looking at innovations in material and sustainable processes. I'm not sure that I understood all of them, but they had some really interesting, um, you know, technical removing, you know, um, less water usage, interesting, innovative ways of weaving, all sorts of kind of responsive fabrics and textiles. So there's definitely a lot of interest in innovation. A bit closer to my kind of knowledge base is the idea of, um, as I mentioned, of the circular economy of keeping products in use. And so we're seeing a lot of trend for, you know, vintage, as I said, in, you know, Spitalfields, we're in the heart of vintage um, fashion shopping area. And actually the image on the slide here is from Shanghai, from um, a lovely store there that I've done some research with. And China, the interest in vintage fashion has, has really been increasing over the last few years. And that seems to be an international trend. So really valuing things that might previously have, um, you know, gone out of usage or gone out of circulation. And also, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, people at Vestier Collective, and I know you have the real, real just um, almost next door to you in the New York campus. And so this idea of kind of valuing, um, you know, older products, products that have a, a have a history. Again, uh, you know, in London, the luxury department store Selfridges has actually launched a repair concierge. Now, I'm aware that in, you know, lots of the parts of the world and for lots of people, repairing things is not uh, a luxury. It's a kind of um, part of your natural life and the way that you're brought up and that you have to live. But I have to say, in lots of areas, this, this has disappeared. And if something was broken, it just would get thrown away. And, you know, it's really shocking how much textile waste, um, you know, arises just because a zip is broken or a button's fallen off. But I definitely see amongst younger people, um, a real interest in repair, fixing, learning how to do it yourself or, or having services that, you know, care for your clothing and accessories. Another thing that's having a positive impact is um, the sharing economy. So things that have come from, you know, things like Uber um, are, are kind of moved into clothing now. And so again, in Selfridges um, earlier the year and last year, they've been having some rentals this in this instance with her and people have been like, super interested in this concept, especially, you know, for occasion wear, where otherwise you might, um, you know, buy a glitzy dress but then you only wear it once or twice and you're not really sure what to do with it I think it's also probably a result of people um, I know in the UK maybe not having that much space to keep lots of clothing so I think you know that idea of, of sharing economy is a really um, interesting one in terms of you know fashion weeks and, and what sort of innovations have happened so we just had London Fashion Week and this is one of the um, professors who works with me at the British School of Fashion who's also a, a, lux a sustainable luxury designer and she um, I think had a really interesting um, experience which was you know using the power of digital to actually live stream a very slow 
and sustainable hand process. So you can see in the images on the slide that Laboni was, um, you know, hand weaving the, the beautiful garment that you see finished there. And I think it's, you know, it's really interesting, these sorts of innovations to see how the you know, the, the modern technology and, and digital platforms um, can actually bring something very artisanal into our homes. One of our honorary professors at the British School of Fashion is, is on the slide here, Christopher Rayburn. And he's one of the designers who this year really, I think, took a although he's always worked in a sustainable space, but took a long, hard look at actually how business um, operates, responsibilities and kind of came up with a, a I suppose what you call a kind of manifesto of how the um, Rayburn business is, was going to proceed. And I really like, you know, talking about here about being part of a future solution. And so some of the initiatives that Rayburn have been um, involved with are zero waste collections. And on the um, slide here, you can see an image of um, some fabulous garments. They're actually made from what would be um, military, they are military parachutes that can't obviously be reused and would normally just go to landfill, I guess, and to waste. They're also made to order, which is one of the sorts of um, techniques and, and practices that's happening a lot more so to, to really kind of drive out the issue of waste. Our friends Gucci as well, reflecting on their, um, you know, their own operations and two different initiatives here. So one around seasonless stock. So one around saying, we're not going to have all of these different seasons and all of these different launches, which was one of the kind of big pressures that's been happening in the fashion industry recently, trying to design uh, products that can be trans seasonal and that are not, you know, not having to have new all the time. And also, again, thinking about incorporating some circular design um, principles. So using, as it says on the slide, here, some recycled materials, organic materials. Um, and one of the things that they've been working with is a, um, a textile, a material called Econil, which is recycled nylons, often sort of from fishing nets that would be just um, trash otherwise. Another example is um, we saw the big piles of textile waste earlier and a Hong Kong based um, NGO that I've been involved with, with previously called Redress have actually um, educated a whole lot of younger designers in um, ways of sort of reducing textile waste in terms of design. They have an annual comp design competition that I recommend you check out. But also from that, one of the, the founders, um, Christina, has got founded a luxury company, the R Collective, and you can see from the slide there, their philosophy about rescuing, reusing, and reimagining. And using, as you can see from the statistic there, very, very, you know, minute amount of fabric waste and working with a lot of, um, you know, luxury materials to create some really uh, sort of innovative and again, transseasonal um, pieces. And then the last slide in this little section is really, you know, what about no physical clothes then? There's been a, a really big conversation about the digital space and about digital clothing, which, um, you know, was emerging pre-pandemic, but I think because of the pandemic has really been viewed through a, through a slightly different lens, the idea of, you know, the sustainability. So what if I don't own a physical garment? What if it isn't produced? Um, you know, what if it just exists um, virtually? And so that's, you know, a really interesting um, initiative that's been happening recently as well. I'm just coming close to the end and I have a few little takeaways from the session before we um, go into a bit of Q&A. So I want to end in a kind of positive way. So um, I think really interestingly now, um, looking at a specific sort of, well, this is a millennial survey, around a third of millennials saying that they're really, you know, very keen on businesses that do good. So they don't mind if businesses make a profit, but they actually want businesses to balance, you know, making a profit with doing good. So really, you know, quite a high proportion of people placing their expectation on business. This was some um, research from Ernst Young and looking at the kind of post-COVID consumer. There's a lot of information on that slide there. But I think some of the things that are really um, you know, important there is although people will still go for price, so there's a whole chunk of people where they're going to put affordability first. There's also people who, you know, significant numbers of people saying that they actually want to put planet first and that they want to put society first. So that's, again, 
probably just a, a bit more than or around a third of people. Um, so I think that kind of consumer sentiment is, is very reassuring for us. And then, you know, I work in a university and one of the pleasures of that is working, you know, with younger people and the sort of um, future professionals of the fashion and luxury industry. And I think this is something anecdotally I've noticed for myself over the last few years, but, you know, confirmed here in, in some research that younger people are not just sort of, you know, hoping for a better future, but they really actually want to be part. And as it says here, they want to lead the change. And then my last bit of content here, um, I really liked this quote, which is from the you know, Business of Fashion, State of Fashion Coronavirus Update, talking about the potential for innovation now and saying, you know, don't let innovation stop. This could be the window of opportunity. Talking about reinventing what you do, having new alternatives for consumers, new value, and also reinventing brands. Um, and so there, hopefully, we've uh, seen some interesting examples of marketing strategy. We've seen some examples of sustainable um, innovation in the luxury fashion sector um, as it works towards building back better. Um, and I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. Okay, so I will start with the first question. Um, <clears throat> what's the di biggest difference you've noticed in marketing fashion in different areas of the world? For example, London, Hong Kong, New York. Oh, great question. Thank you. So, so I would a second part to the question if you oh, don't mind. Go ahead. Are go they ahead. more similar than they are different? Okay, that's a really good question. What I would say is, I mean, there's definitely um, some brands that would have a global presence and their marketing is, you know, would, would be consistent in different places. One of the things I think um, is interesting to think about different parts of the world is like how you receive information. So if you're in London and New York, for example, they're like walking cities and we have subway systems and you, you know, you see, you might walk past a, a store window and, and you're seeing, you know, products in the window. When you're somewhere like Hong Kong, although you can walk around, but you have a lot of more things that is a much more vertical city. Mm -hmm. So you don't often have, you do have some, but you also have some things where they're up in a, you know, a, a skyscraper and you're not going to access that in that way. Um, but I would say, a big challenge for brands now is that almost any brand can be global from day one through the, the wonders of the internet. And so I think, and a lot of people recently are wanting more kind of localized um, products and content. But I tend to think that the people are more similar than they are different. So the sort of person, you know, who likes, you know, for example, like me, you like vintage fashion or something, something, you're going to have more similar tastes and want to have the same sorts of experiences as someone else who likes vintage fashion, let's say in New York or in Melbourne or in Shanghai, to someone who's, um, you know, really into sportswear, athleisure or something. So I think, um, Definitely, there are differences in terms of platforms as well. So how people, you know, against different social media tastes. And I think that's a big challenge for brands when they go into different parts of the world. Thank you. Our second question is, what do you see as the next biggest trend within the sustainable fashion industry? Okay, another great question. I mean, it's really, um, what I would say, as I mentioned in the presentation, the idea of circular circularity. So the idea of circular economy is a really big um, trend in terms of it's something that people are really engaging in. And really as part of that, thinking about regenerative practices. So it's no longer just about um, you know, minimizing negative impact. It's much more about thinking how you could create positive impact. OK, our next question. If businesses are moving towards building more timeless pieces, do you see prices on these pieces going up as a way to maintain profit margins? Yeah, this is a okay, great question. I think, I mean, one of the um, challenges that there, there often is around sustainability and sustainable fashion is the price point. We saw um, what, one of the takeaway slides, there are a whole you know, group of people who are always going to be more motivated by price. And there's always a big argument that sustainable fashion, you know, is price inaccessible. But I think what it is, is that people don't necessarily um, know about some of some of the brands. So there are obviously sustainable brands at different price points. But I think in terms of a business model, you know, if we look at some of the big luxury companies, um, I think we had some news about, you know, the head of some of those in the last couple of days, their billionaire status, you know, there is 
money in a system is just not fairly distributed. So I don't think it's just like one or the other. It doesn't have to be just the price has to go up. I think but businesses can look at, you know, what's value. And, you know, we had that great documentary a few years ago, The True Cost. And I think that's one of the things that for consumers, I would say in North America um, and in Europe, we've got so used to clothing being cheap. We just don't mm. understand what the actual cost of making something, you know, could be and should be. Mm. There's a second part to this question, Natasha, and that is, how do you think circular and sustainable fashion is going to alter the supply slash demand levels? Um, I think in terms of, I mean, what I would say is I think a lot of emerging designers are thinking in those terms. Now, it's, I think it's in one sense, it's quite a hard time to start a fashion business because there's a big question about should you even be creating anything this is something you know if we have there's a lot of conversations we have enough stuff there's already enough clothing you know should we be starting new brands and businesses and on the other side of that I mean I said at the beginning I love fashion and creativity I love making um, so there's that natural human desire to create so we kind of have to have a, a bit of uh, of balance of that but I think definitely there's an increased there is an increasing demand from consumers to have from a group of consumers to have more sustainable and more so and I think as we get um, as the information becomes more accessible as, as it's easier for people to understand and avoid you know greenwashing then I think definitely that that also impacts in in terms of I suppose the area I'm in marketing and, and the communication of the products. Okay. So the next question too has two parts. Um, first, you have showcased a number of fashion companies who are taking initiatives. What about those who are not? I think um, that's a great question as well. Your questions are so good tonight. Um, I would say that it's increasingly difficult for um, fashion companies to avoid engaging with sustainability. What we've seen, I think, from consumers is they don't actually mind you know, they, I think people understand no one's going to be 100% sustainable, but I think they want to know that you understand your own impact and that you've made a commitment and what your specific journey is going to be and telling people about it. So that whole idea of transparency, which a few years ago, just everything was hidden and, and people maybe weren't even interested in that. But now it's become a really big you know, conversation. So I think it's go people will become irrelevant. And what I think a lot of people, you know, I'm doing research in this area, and what a lot of people are saying is they really, it's almost like they don't want to talk about sustainable fashion anymore. They just want fashion to be sustainable mm. so that you're not even having to, you know, justify in that sense. That's really interesting. Um, so second part is in terms of profit and brand image, how damaging will it be to a company who does nothing? Well, um, as I said, I think it, the pressures are coming from different um, places. So, so far, I've really talked about external pressures, but also, you know, what I've found from my own research and observation is, you know, the specific, not only younger people, but younger people going into businesses. I think now a lot more people want their job to have value, their work mm -hmm. to have meaning, and they want to themselves be associated with this concept of good work. So I think a lot of the... Um, you know, the positive movements are also coming from inside companies. And I think people where they have a choice will also vote with their feet in that and they are attracted to work in companies and to stay yes. in companies that are doing good. So I think that will have an impact as well. The questions are coming in, Natasha. So <laughs> um, the next one is, have you predicted when fashion sustainable development will be realized on a large scale? Oh gosh, I think, you know, we're seeing some really big commitments made. And I think really interestingly, if you were watching when they had the Copenhagen Fashion Summit, a lot of the um, observers are asking questions and holding people to account. So they're saying, okay, you've made these commitments publicly, where's the actions? And I think that's, you know, the big thing people are, it's going to be difficult to keep talking and not doing. Um, I think some of the challenges are huge. You know, as I mentioned, we were having these, um, you know, still having these big consumption days. We, you know, I mentioned the singles day in China. So the, you know, the, the fast fashion businesses, some of them in the UK are really booming and doing really well. So it's not that everyone's turned their back on that. So we're not um, out of the woods on that. But I think, you know, when if we can get more, you know, government level pressure, 
um, and also investment. So, I mean, when we went to things like solar power, you see government investment in helping that transition. And I think that's what's, um, you know, that's what's called for in this instance before we can see that. Thank you. Okay, the next question. Do you think there will be a move towards a focus on the content marketing to communicate sustainability goals through the likes of reports, brand blogs, et cetera, rather than social media and influencer culture? I think, again, it's probably, um, I would say, different people want different things. And I mean, it was interesting, I talked about, you know, how Gucci pivoted their Instagram account and lots of the different luxury brands did through the pandemic. I don't think people want to be beaten over the head with this stuff every day. They don't want to feel bad about their purchases. So I think they want to hear positive stories, but I think it really depends. Some businesses are founded, you know, as a social enterprise, for example, and they're founded on these very positive values and wanting to make a difference. So it's a natural part of their brand identity then to tell those stories. I think it's more difficult for some of the companies that weren't established like that, that are now kind of pivoting into this. And I think, you know, for any um, brand, they're going to have to stay true to their own kind of tone of voice and way of communicating. But I think, you know, as I said, there's increasing calls for this information, but everyone doesn't necessarily want that just, you know, front of mind at, at all times. And also, I think there is a danger. Um, people are quite cynical, especially in different parts of the world. And there's a danger of being accused of greenwashing. Um, so I think that is a very difficult, which is why we need, you know, our young, um, you know, like our students and young professionals to be really educated. So they have a really great understanding of this and that they can then advise on these kind of strategies. Okay. Next question. What is your view on ASOS's fast forward program? Will it have an impact on other fast, fast fashion retailers? Yeah, I think again, really interestingly, um, with this kind of some of the sort of people who've made that their money and their their way in the world in fast fashion, then you know moving into this sort of area, I think it's a great initiative. I know that they worked um, around you know, circular design principles and materials. So I think anything like that, I say, good. I mean, it's moving in the right direction. Even the debate and discussion about it has, you know, raised it as an issue. Um, I think we should try to encourage movement uh, in a positive direction. And I'm aware as well, they used previously have, you know, endorsed um, different sustainability initiatives. So um, I'm a great believer in, you know, rewarding, um, you know, good initiatives um, that are actually invested in with proper research. And I believe that that's been the, the situation there. Mm -hmm. I think some for some fast fashion businesses, it's, it, it's almost still remaining irrelevant because their customer is not asking for it. So that's, um, mm -hmm. you know, that is still problematic. Okay. So how can brands avoid being accused of greenwashing? Okay, yeah, I think, as I said, this is really interesting because in different parts of the world, I think customers um, and consumers have different ideas about what, you know, what information they want, how they receive it and what greenwashing might be. I mean, I know myself, you know, you can look at someone could just stick an eco or they can just have the color green on something. And, you know, as mm -hmm. humans, we're very susceptible to these kind of signals. Um, so I think, you know, being clear, understanding, I think what, and, you know, auditing, knowing what your own impact is across the different areas, you know, across environmental impact, across, you know, social impact and, and the financial impact, and then having a really clear narrative for yourself and then deciding, I guess, how you're going to engage um, in telling those stories. But I think until we have some, um, you know, really defined, almost legislated frameworks, then it's hard. I mean, we have a lot of different frameworks to support that, but just in terms of communicating it. And I believe that those are on their way. So we'll look forward to that. Okay. The next question, Natasha, is from Greg Patton who is from your master's course at GCU. And he says, hello. <laughs> that luxury bricks and mortar stores may be on their way out with more sales being generated online. And then there's a second part, I'll let you answer that. Okay, well, I think, I mean, especially well in the UK we know there's been an enormous pressure over the last decade on kind of uh, on the high street on retail space on you know physical retail digital was still a you know e-commerce was a smaller part um, and that's kind of expanded but lockdown but people do still like an experience and a physical um, you know spaces and places to go so I think some of it I mean what the not 
just me, but predictions are talking about, you know, some is going to stay. There's, we're going to probably lose bits in the middle. I think one of the pandemic, um, you know, results has been that local high streets and shopping areas have revived because people have been, you know, in lockdown, they've been working from home. So that's been a kind of, you know, a positive impact on that kind of retail structure. And I think for the last few years, retail spaces have been thinking about how to reinvent themselves as more kind of, I suppose, social spaces and spaces of entertainment. I think, again, what would be helpful is, you know, government support for those spaces, um, you know, in, in terms of the UK specifically, and just how can you help people keep those spaces as and compete in a fair way with sort of online um, retailers. Mm. So you sounds like you may have already answered the second part, but I'll let I'll tell you, I'll pose it. Or do you feel that there will always be a need uh, for luxury fashion stores? I think that the especially with things like a flagship, a flagship store is the um, gives the luxury brand a it's like a universe. They can create the environment. They can, you know, sell dreams through that. I think probably what's going to happen is we'll have, we will have physical spaces. They are still being invested in and, and created, um, but also there will be a lot more digital, I suppose, content created from those. So that hope they'll be used in a, in a wider range of ways. I mean, I love going into a physical store, so I hope for me that that happens. And also, you know. Um, I'm a great fan of retail staff. They're often really highly skilled and they can introduce mm -hmm. <laughs> you to, to products and things in a way that I'm not sure yet that the sort of chatbots can. So it'd be nice to, to support that as well. Yes, exactly. The jobs and not only, I also appreciated people telling me not to buy something. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the next question is from Michelle Gabriel and she is a, a faculty member at GCNYC. You mentioned innovation as a potential silver lining for the pressure companies may be facing. Innovation is certainly needed to dig the industry out of the hole it has created, but the lack of focus and value on innovation from businesses, fashion or otherwise, over the last several decades could be seen as creating the situation the fashion industry now finds itself in. How do you think we could further incentivize businesses to prioritize innovation as a business imperative rather consider it rather than considering it as a tool to use when they're in a tough spot? Ah, great question. I mean, I think maybe partnerships and collaborations. So I know, you know, several businesses will kind of support innovation hubs and that kind of thing. And I think, you know, in investing in research and development, um, often it's only the bigger companies that have got, and have got deep pockets that can do that. But then if they can support, you know, smaller um, local initiatives, and then again, if those things can be incentivized by governments um, and, and other organizations, then I think that's the, the way forward. And I think, you know, education has a, a part to play in that as well just to to bring together you know again not necessarily younger people but often students are full of energy and ideas and mm -hmm. and, and having that i mean for example someone like gucci they created their sort of youth panels so they within their own organization having some younger people making sort of parallel decisions to the to the board so I think there are different ways of working I think people are going to demand those and I think where we see innovation paying off and being rewarded hopefully it will be um, embraced and not just driven by the bottom line. Okay. Thank you. I, we have two more. I'm not sure if we'll have time, but we'll try. Um, this is from Susan Joy, who is a student at GCNYC. What's your long-term vision for success for a thriving future fashion industry? Oh gosh, I, I think it's a great question. I'd really like to see, as I say, um, getting away from the negative images, celebrating the skills and creativity. I'd love to see more, you know, artisanal, handcrafted, um, you know, products being able to be produced and, and celebrating the creativity that there is around mm -hmm. the world so a lot of you know global aspects so that fashion itself even in terms of its ideas becomes less exploitative and extractive and becomes more uh, collaborative and, and creative. Mm -hmm. I think those are our key terms for moving forward collaboration and creativity mm -hmm. and our last question is from Adrian Studer who's also on faculty at GCNYC. Do you think that in addition to customer and employee pressure for more sustainable fashion, that increased involvement from government regulate government 
slash regulators is needed to hold brands accountable and not gloss over with great marketing. Self-regulation has often not worked in other industries. Yes, I entirely agree. I think, um, you know, there's a lot of clever people who can work around things. And I think you want some real sort of positive incentives for actual actions rather than than words. And I think that is a bit of a danger where people get the latest buzzword and, and just slap that on whatever they're doing. Um, but hopefully, as I say, we're, we're, we'll see pressure from all sides um, to create, you know, more innovative end result and a, a happier planet and happier people and mm -hmm. a happier fashion industry. Well, Natasha, thank you so much. So we've reached the end of the webinar. Thank you to everyone who attended and submitted questions and a very special thank you to you, Professor Natasha Radcliffe Thomas. Oh, thank you. It's been my absolute pleasure. <laughs> And we look forward to seeing everyone next week at the next Resilience and Reconstruction event on Thursday, November 19. Okay, thanks again, Natasha. <laughs> Thank you.